Okay, you guys, this is my third try to get this thing going. First time we had a baby crying the whole time, and the second time, I don't know, my internet just kicked me off. So anyway, we're going to try again. So you guys, grab your PowerPoint, um, open up your books to page 64, 65-ish. That's where we're going to get started. And we are just going to talk about tissues. Now this chapter goes, it's going to move pretty fast. It's just actually just a section of a chapter in our new textbook. So um, it's going to move pretty quickly. Most of it is just memorization. There's not a whole lot of info here, but it is, you know, more memorization than anything. So just know it's going to move fast tonight after we go over everything in here. You need to make sure that you read the chapter and we'll do that. So um, anyway, so you guys go ahead and get started. If you'll remember, we talked about the levels of uh, organization. So cells make tissues, tissues make organs and so on. So cells, same type of cells, come together to make a tissue, certain type of tissue, and tissues, and yet can have different types of tissue that come together to make organs. Okay, but there's four basic type of tissue. So when you think of tissue, okay, everything in your body really is tissue, but it's because it's made of cells, right? So um, it can it covers you know everything in your body is falls into one of these. All right, so epithelial tissue lines and covers so think skin the lining on the inside of like your digestive tract the pleura around your lungs anything that lines or covers is considered epithelial tissue and I always that one to me is easy to remember because epithelial kind of sounds like epidermis i think skin lines and covers okay connective tissue supports and it also does exactly what it says it does it connects right it holds things together it supports so connective tissue is it has a broad broad range of different types of tissue from blood blood is a type of connective tissue all the way to bone bone is another type of connective tissue so it's a very wide range of function and level of kind of support or you know a structure Muscle tissue generates force. We know that there's three types of muscle tissue. We're going to talk about those three, but skeletal muscle tissue we'll specifically talk more about when we get to um, the muscle chapter later on this semester. And the nervous tissue, of course, conveys information. You can think about your neurons. They, they convey or they st are stimulated and move electrical pulses. So that's what nervous tissue. We will talk about nervous tissue, but very, very briefly right now. We have a whole chapter over nervous over the nervous system that will cover more of that information. All right, so uh, epithelial tissue, apical versus basal. So off epithelia have an inside and an outside, usually referred to as the apical or the top of it, and the basal surface, which is like the base of your epithelial uh, tissue. And so if you look right here, this one, you can see. Okay, so this, for example, would be the apical surface, and this would be the basal surface, that dark purple. It's called a basal membrane, is, and all epithelial tissue has it. It's kind of like the starting place for the tissue, if you will. But it's the base, that's what it's talking about when it says apical is the top, basal is the bottom. Okay, it's like it's the base. Now, ep epithelial cells, we see a couple different things. Uh, one, they have different shapes, uh, different shapes, so they can be, they can be uh, sorted by shape, and then they can be sorted by uh, structure, or how they're kind of built. So squamous cells are flat, and I just remember that squamous is squashed, squamous, squashed, squashed, squamous, so they're very flat. Okay, so this is squamous, okay? Cuboidal are exactly like what they sound. They're cube shaped. Okay, they're kind of squared off. And then columnar, again, exactly like what they sound like. They look they look like little columns. Okay, That's, they're taller than they are wide. Okay, so um, let's see. Make sure I'm not, I don't have all my notes here with me because they're at school. So I'm not trying to make sure I cover what I need to in the book too. 
Um, okay, the second way the epithelial cells are uh, kind of determined or given their name is how they're arranged. So simple means one layer and stratified means more than one layer. So this gives you an example. So these are squamous cells, okay, and they just have one layer. So you can see that. So this would be called simple squamous. Okay, simple cuboidal means it just has one layer of those cube-shaped cells. And then simple columnar has these longer, taller kind of cells, okay? Now, notice over here, okay, so stratified means that it's got more than one layer. It's like layered on top of each other, okay? When you're looking at, you're trying to determine the name of a tissue, and if you're looking at epithelial tissue, one epithelial tissue is always going to have this basal membrane down here, and their, their cells are going to kind of be these different shapes. Okay, but look, the apical surface, which is the one opposite of the basal membrane, okay, it's kind of the top of it, if you will, okay, is what determines the shape. Okay, so don't look here and think cuboidal. You look at the very top of it. Those are squashed or squamous, okay? So the, this is stratified squamous. Okay, this one you can see it's still cuboidal even at the top surface. So it's stratified cuboidal. It's got multiple layers, more than one layer, but the top layer is cuboid shaped. So that's why that one is. And then columnar down here, okay? Again, same thing, it, it's got multiple layers, but the very top layer is tells you the shape of what it is. Now, one, a couple things to know about, um, if you'll look on page 65, it says simple epithelial. So simple squamous epithelium has a single layer, it says a flattened cell, so we looked at that. So here's some examples of where you'll find this, and it's, you guys definitely need to know examples of where this can these different types of epithelial tissue are found so you might write these in your notes okay uh, the gas exchanging cavities so like the alveoli of the lungs the alveoli of your lungs are like those little kind of balloon kind of look like little grape clusters or balloons inside your lungs that's where gas exchange actually takes place why then i, I would ask you this in class but think about this why would it be so important for that area to be simple squamous? Okay, think about that for a minute. Simple squamous. So you think about, here's, here's what you think about, okay? Simple squamous is very, very, very thin, okay? And it's important, okay? Gas exchange is, is really important. Nutrient exchange is important. Like it says in your book, the lining of the abdominal cavity, okay? We see simple squamous there. The endothelium says this is the single layer of cells that lines the blood vessel at the end of the heart. We want exchange to occur very easily in those particular areas because oxygen and waste needs to be able to move through, okay? Ox things are not going to move through the cells quickly in a stratified tissue, okay? They're going to move through quickly here because they're very flat, okay? There's lots of surface area for them to move through. Okay, so look, it says simple squamous epithelia allow rapid diffusion of substances because of how thin they are. Okay, uh, I'm still on page 65. Simple squamous epithelia, I'm sorry, simple cuboidal epithelia, it says have a single layer of cuboid cells, just like we saw here. Um, says that they surround tubules in the kidneys and are present in different uh, sec sec ooh, secretory glands. Sounds weird. Um, so these says these are typically involved in secretion or absorption. So again, something we find that where substances need to be moved through those cells very easily and very quickly. You know, in the kidney tubules, we find filtration. So um, it's able to move through in and out quickly. And uh, same thing with absorption. You know, things need, need nutrients or things that our body still needs need to be able to absorb through that and it can do that quickly as well. So simple columnar epithelia have a single layer of columnar cells. We're talking about this one right here. Okay, they're found in the lining of some of the ducts in the kidneys and the stomach and intestines. But look at this, they sometimes have microvilla on their apical surfaces. Okay, um, if you look at the bottom of page 66, 
there's a picture of some single layered uh, epithelial columnar epithelial tissue and you can kind of see see what that looks like it's pretty pretty neat looking okay so again uh, secretion and absorption is a big thing with columnar cells again one layer it's very easy for things to fuse in and out okay to move in and out now microvilli it says that we all often find microvilli in columnar cells and microvilli are like small like little fingers if you will on the top of cells and basically what they do is they increase surface area Okay, so they increase the layer that actually does the absorbing. And that makes absorption and secretion move a lot faster. So that's why that's important. All right, let's talk about, we'll talk about transitional in a minute. Okay, let's keep going on page 66. Stratified epithelia, so stratified squamous, those are found where chemical and mechanical protection are most needed. So again, skin, right? If we, if we pour, I don't know, maybe think about anything that we put on our bodies. Uh, I mean, body wash or shampoo, for example, has lots and lots of chemicals in it, but those aren't just automatically absorbed into our bloodstream because that stratified squamous epithelial tissue is really strong and it protects from mechanical damage and chemical damage. Mechanical. Right, if you brush the doorway on your way out of the door, your skin doesn't just slough off and slide off and expose muscle underneath. That's because stratified squamous tissue is very, very strong and it's held together very well. Um, so that's another example of a really strong lining that is necessary. Look, it says stratified squamous epithelia are also found in areas that are closely connected to the outside of the body, including the mouth and the throat and the anus and rectum. It says the most apical cells in the epithelium of the skin are actually dead and dying cells that have keratin. So when we're talking about the skin, specifically the stratified squamous, a lot of the cells on top are actually dead, and you guys know that. Um, so we'll talk about that more in detail when we get to the integumentary system next, but just so you know, those are dead, and that's why you know you can scratch them off, and it's not going to hurt. They're not; a, they're dead. They don't they don't have nerve endings in that that particular area anymore. Or they're not. I wouldn't say nerve endings. We have nerve endings in the top of our skin, but we, uh, you know, it's just it's dead tissue, so it sloughs off over time. Look at this, it says the layer of keratinized cells help prevent loss of water through the skin and provides additional protection. So another thing, like it says, these, especially the apical layer of these cells has a lot of keratin, which hardens, like kind of like your fingernails have lots and lots of keratin in your hair, um, but your skin does as well. And you think about it, you don't lay in the bathtub and then when you get out, you're bloated and full of water, right? That doesn't happen because those keratinized cells are held together really well. They don't let water just diffuse into your body, or at least if the cells are alive, they're not gonna let, let it do that. So it's stratified cuboidal and stratified columnar, okay, are relatively rare. They're not found a whole lot. So mostly they're found in like ducts of glands. And when I say ducts, I'm talking about just like tubes that leave glands that go into something else. Uh, like it said, sweat glands that are in your skin, they have ducts, right, that head to the outside of your body. That's where the sweat drains to. So that's an example of where you might find this type of tissue. One other thing to note, too, is uh, a lot of columnar cells in particular also contain what, what are called goblet cells, specifically in, like, the digestive system. So we find goblet cells, and goblet cells are basically produce mucus, which is kind of gross, but we see we have a lot of mucus in our digestive system because all of the acid in our bellies and our stomach that has to help break down food also would break down our tissue, our epithelial tissue, if it weren't for this mucus coating that our belly has, that our inside of our stomach and small intestine has. So these goblet cells are what 
produces or uh, secretes mucus into those tissues. I always remember that. I don't, this is really gross, and I don't know why I remember it this way, but goblet cells, it's like I think about drinking out of a goblet and drinking some nasty mucus drink. It's like slurping it up out of the goblet. I don't know. I know that's gross, but. All right, and then the last type of epithelial tissue we're going to talk about is called transitional tissue, and this does exactly like what it sounds like it does. It's transitional, right? It moves or changes, transitions, depending on what's going on or stretchable. This is particularly found inside the, the Mom, urinary bladder. Mom, yes. Can I um, watch Thomas the Train? All right, now. Go play. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this. So, um, anyway, so we, uh, transitional tissue, primarily, if I'm asking you on a test, you know, if something, if the answer is transitional tissue, I'm going to tell you where it would be found because it's kind of hard to look at it and know because if the bladder is really, really full and it's pressing on the tissue, it's going to look squamous. But if it's if the bladder is not full and you look at the tissue, it might look more columnar. So because it changes like that, it changes shape depending on how full it is. Um, I would always tell you if I'm going to ask you that on the question, I would tell you where it is, where it would be found. But that's what makes that special is that it's transitional. So your bladder, your bladder's really it can hold a lot of fluid, right, a lot of waste because of that transitional tissue. All right, epithelial glands secrete substances. So we'll, we have a whole system on, or a whole chapter on endocrine glands, so we're not going to get into endocrine a whole lot, mostly exocrine here. And exocrine, crin means to secrete, so endocrine means secrete within, endo means inside, and exocrine then would mean secrete outside. So this is like an example would be sweat glands, uh, oil glands, things like that. It says epithelial cells that are organized to produce and secrete substances are called glands. A gland may just have a handful of cells or it may be large and complex with blood vessels and connective tissue. Usually if it's that complex, it's, it's going to be an organ. It says an, an exocrine gland secretes its product to the outside world, right? Outside, exo is outside, crin is secrete. So uh, exocrine gland cells are classified by their structure. Uh -oh, I'll have that on here. Unicellular, okay, unicellular, uni means one. So if you're thinking unicellular, it's one celled, okay, that's what it means, single cell. It says are isolated secretory cells in the epithelium in humans. Uh, these are found in portions of the linings of the respiratory and digestive tracts. So they secrete mucus, um, which gives it that, like kind of like what we talked about earlier, the mu like a mucus surface. Same thing, your respiratory system has mucus too. Multicellular, okay, is just like it sounds. It's got multiple cells, right? It's got lots of cells. And it says that's two basic parts. One is a secretory unit uh, where cells actually move that product out. And then the other is uh, part of the duct. So if you guys look on page 67, you'll see these. Okay, you'll be able to see these. The bottom of page 67. It says an exocrine gland is simple if it has a single unbranched duct. So kind of like a, I think about a compound leaf or a, you know, like a single, simple leaf, same kind of idea. So simple, it just has a single duct. So it gives you two examples of that on here. And then it's compound if it's got lots of branches which makes sense, simple, one, compound, multiple, okay? So it gives you, you can see some examples of those on page 67. All right, true or false? I'll let you guys maybe pause for a second and answer these. You can use your notes, okay? And then we'll get going because I'm kind of running out of time. All right, connective tissue. Connective tissue, this one gets a little bit hairier because there's a lot of different types of connective tissue. So lots of varied functions. Uh, can strengthen the body and the organs, protects internal organs, right? Cushions, 
Uh, adipose tissue is another type of connective tissue. If you remember that, that's fatty tissue. Uh, it helps maintain the shape, right? It provides lots of structure. And then it's a framework for muscles to pull. That's, that would be the bones, obviously. So there's three different types of fibers we're going to talk about. And uh, collagen, reticular, and elastic. And there's different, so many subclasses of tissues, and we'll, we will get into those. Um, let's go over real quick. I want to read this little section at the beginning of page 68 to you guys uh, where it talks about the, uh, kind of gives you an introduction to connective tissue. Uh, it says connective tissue is found throughout the body. We just went over its functions. It comprises several major classes. Okay, so we're look, and you can look on that table on page 69. We have connective tissue proper, cartilage, bone tissue, or osseous tissue, and then we have blood. Now, connective tissue proper is where we're going to see the most subclasses, but cartilage has some too. Ooh, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> excuse me. So, uh, Anyways, we'll talk about blood more in detail later on, but we'll, we'll at least mention it here because it is part of the connective tissue. It says all forms of connective tissue, and I'm about halfway down on the left-hand column on page 68, include both cells and extracellular material. Remember, extracellular is outside of the cell. Or what it's also called is an extracellular matrix. So all connective tissue, okay, you know, we talked about epithelial tissue has cell and a basal membrane. Uh, connective tissue has cells and what's called the matrix. And the matrix is the uh, kind of that extracellular fluid, or doesn't have to be fluid, but extracellular tissue that's found outside of the cell and not hold it together. We'll talk about different types of that. The types of cells and the nature of the matrix is what's going to change uh, what type of tissue we have. Extracellular fiber, it says, are an important part of connective tissue, helping to determine its mechanical properties. Three types of fibers are found in connective tissue. Collagen, says these are formed from tropocollagen collagen proteins. So again, proteins. Go back up here. You can write it on this page if you want to. So collagen is formed from proteins that link together. It says collagen fibers are strong and resistant to stretch. Okay, so they give what's called tensile strength to tissue. Okay, so very, very strong, resistive to stretch. Reticular fibers, it says, are thinner and they're not as strong as collagen. They help to provide a structural framework. And you'll be able to see that when we look at some pictures um, over on, if you kind of start looking at, oh, no, I have a picture of reticular tissue. I've got some we're going to look at. We're going to look at a whole bunch of tissue types under the microscopes over the next few days. So, Anyways, it says that these provide a structural framework. So they, they're going to give structure. They're kind of like building, you know, it's kind of like a building, like you think about the, the, uh, like the frame of a building and things like that. And then elastic fibers, it says, can lengthen considerably when stretched and then spring back to their original length when the stretching force is removed. So you think about elastic uh, you'll see a lot of that in cartilage. Okay. Um, it says elastic fibers give springiness or elasticity to tissues. And you're going to see most organs in our body are a mixture of epithelial and different types of connective tissue. We'll look at that. All right, now look at tension, compression, and elasticity on uh, page 68 in the, the book. It says before tension was used to describe an emotional state, it had and still has another meaning. It says a force that pulls something apart. So a force that pulls something apart. That's what we talked about with that collagen has lots of tensile strength. It's going to keep things from getting pulled apart. Okay, tensile strength is the ability to withstand a pulling force without stretching much or breaking. So you think about um, 
think about like your bone, for example, if you just pull on either end of a bone, it would take a ton of force for it to actually, you know, break apart. So that's lots and lots of, of strength. But now you think about your skin, if you were to pull apart on your skin over, you know, I mean, it wouldn't take as, I mean, it's still not going to happen easily, but it would take a lot less uh, force to do that to your skin than it would your bone, for example. So anyway, it says the opposite of tension is compression, a force that pushes in. So compressive strength is the ability to withstand compression. That's another thing. You think about bone, it can withstand compression. Yes. You're going to have to wait a few minutes, baby. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm recording my lecture. I'll come help you in a little bit. You're just going to have to take care of it right now. <laughs> anyway, so um, it says an example of the difference between these two types, consider a rope. When it's used in tug of war, that's tensile strength, right? It's pulling, it's pulling apart, okay? Um, when the rope does not have any significant compressive strength, it says if you try to compress the rope by pushing the ends together, it does not resist. It simply folds and buckles. All right, and then lastly, elasticity is the ability to stretch and go back to its original state. Um, it says elastic fibers give elasticity to the skin. That's what's in our lower part of our, like our dermis, just connective tissue underneath our, the top layer of our skin. It says, unfortunately, elastic fibers in the skin, like the fibers in the waistband of a favorite pair of athletic shorts, tend to lose their elasticity as they get older. So as a result, the skin gets baggier, wrinkles, etc. That's why we get all wrinkly, lose that elasticity. So that's those. I wanted you guys to be familiar with those uh, terms. All right, connective tissue proper. Let's look at the, well, classes anyways connective tissue proper again wide variety of locations and functions plays a role in immune defenses we'll look at all of that um, in just a little bit cartilage is another type of connective tissue we know you guys know what cartilage is you think about your nose or your ear uh, but in your knee you know you've got lots of cartilage between your bones so we'll talk about that bone tissue of course you guys know what that one does. And then blood. So like it says, provides transportation, regulation and protection, transportation of oxygen and nutrients, etc. All right. So connective tissue proper. Let's look on here at connective tissue proper, page 68 and 69. That table is going to be like your best friend. So use this table a lot. All right, so connected tissue breaks down into two other types of tissue. We have loose and dense. Loose, okay, connective tissue includes these three types that are listed in that table. Areolar, let's see if it goes, here we go. Areolar, uh, reticular, and adipose. So if you'll notice, these are all very soft, um, softer tissues. And... So we'll look at these. So areolar connective tissue says it's found throughout the body as a layer beneath the epithelial tissue. So it's usually not just the skin, but even like in the digestive system and et cetera. It's under that little lining layer, lining, lining layer. Oh, I can't talk. It says it holds water in its gel-like matrix. Areolar connective tissue provides support, strength, and elasticity to epithelial and thanks to collagen, uh, it says thanks to collagen, reticular and elastic fiber. So it plays a role in inflammation and immune system defenses because it contains mast cells, macrophages, and white blood cells, which are all part of your immune system. Some of them attack, you know, use like allergic responses, macrophages eat foreign material, etc. So that's something important to note kind of gel like so you're gonna see um, typically the softer the tissue the more cells and the less matrix versus uh, the more the harder tissue you see less cells and more matrix 
Um, but anyway, so this one you can kind of see the cells mixed in and all the other fluid fibers that you see in here, these are all extra cellular matrix. That is part of the matrix that you see. All right, reticular tissue is specifically found in the spleen, okay, also found in the bone marrow or the lymph nodes. It's another immune system. Your spleen um, is part of your immune system. It's typically really purple, has lots and lots of blood flow to it. It says in all these locations, it provides a loose framework for blood forming cells, okay, like in the bone marrow or the spleen that produces some of your white blood cells and houses them there. And so that's reticular tissue. So when you think reticular tissue, think spleen, lymph nodes, immune system, bone marrow, where your cells are made, et cetera. And then the last one here is adipose tissue, which are your fat cells. Look, it says adipose tissue consists almost entirely of cells. So there's very little matrix, which makes sense. You think about adipose tissue, which is fat tissue. Okay, it's very, very, very soft, right? So it doesn't have much matrix. Okay, it's more cells. All right, so next we have dense connective tissue three types here as well. And you can see this again on the chart or you can read along kind of where I am in the book. It says as, uh, so you have three types. Dense connective tissue has fewer cells and has a lot more matrix, mostly fibers. So you can see cells in here, but it's mostly fibers in this one, for example. It says regular dense connect connective tissue consists of collagen fibers. So it's gonna be very strong. Remember collagen is that resistant to the stretch that are parallel to one another, okay? So this picture is this dense, regular connective. So tendons, you think, remember, tendons connect muscle to bone, and it's really important that those don't get stretched, right? That they don't get injured, that they're very strong, otherwise your joints won't work like they're supposed to. Want your, uh, Muscles won't work like they're supposed to. You know, your bones won't be attached like they need to. So that is, um, that's why they have to be so strong. All right, irregular dense connective tissue. An example of this would be um, the dermis, which is found right under the top layer of your skin. The skin that you see, did you might come up? Okay. The skin that you see is your epidermis, and the dermis lies directly under that, okay? So irregular dense connective tissue, like regular dense connective tissue, it says it's composed primarily of collagen, but it says the fibers are not all parallel. They might look, they might be all kinds of different directions. So they're not regular. If you think regular, they're parallel. They line up beside each other, irregular, doesn't necessarily do that. It might be going this way and this way. So as a result, irregular dense connective tissue is really good at resisting stretching from a variety of directions, which we need in our skin, right? We don't want our skin to just, every time you touch it, it falls apart. We need it to be really strong. All right. Um, Dense elastic connective tissue is like it sounds. It has, so it says it has an extracellular matrix full of elastic fibers. If you look at the bottom of page 70, there's a picture of this dense elastic connective tissue. Okay, and you can see it there, lots of elastic fibers. It says it's found in the walls of airways and your large arteries that have to be able to stretch. All right, cartilage, chondroblasts, okay? So when you hear the word blast or chondroblast, okay, you think uh, blast usually means that it's making something or it's building something. And chondro means cartilage, always means cartilage. So like building cartilage is what this means. And it says that chondroblasts are the, are, uh, secrete the matrix in the cartilage. So they're the ones that secrete the extracellular fluid that makes up cartilage. 
Okay, so cartilage is part of the skeleton. So it's found on the end of the bones and then between bones, but we also see it right in like our nose and ears and some other areas. All right, so um, says the extracellular matrix of cartilage contains collagen fibers, and it says proteoglycan molecules, which are proteins that have carbs in them. You don't, you don't necessarily need to know that for this class. Um, it says they mobilize many water molecules, so they have a lot, cartilage has lots of water in it. It says the high water content of cartilage helps to account for its high resistance of compression, right? So you find cartilage kind of between, like you think about cartilage in your knee, and there's a disc of cartilage between your femur and your tibia where they meet behind your kneecap. And it's important. Lots of water is found in that area, in the, those uh, areas of cartilage, and that's because they need to be able to really cushion between those bones. Same idea for um, like fibrocartilage here where it talks about the discs down in your spine, okay? Those need to have lots of compression strength, right? Every time you jump, you're, you don't want your spine to just crush on each other. All right, so let's look. It says the most common form of cartilage is hyaline cartilage, which is really smooth and shiny. And I think hyaline means like glass, so it looks like glass. It's really shiny. If you've ever eaten... Um, like if you've eaten a chicken bone, like a drumstick or a wing or something, and you notice the end of the bone is like really smooth and shiny. It doesn't look like the, you know, the main kind of the middle part of the bone. That's the cartilage. That's hyaline cartilage. It's real shiny and smooth. So we see that over the ends of the long bones. And then the ribs is another area where you see this. You know how your ribs, if you look at the skeleton that we have there in the classroom, the ribs, the bones of the ribs kind of stop about halfway up the chest. And then it's actually just hyaline cartilage that's connected to the sternum or the breastbone. Um, elastic cartilage is, that's kind of like your ear or your nose. It's going to be a lot springier. It's going to be a lot softer. Okay. Probably has more cells than matrix, but very, uh, oh, the epiglottis as well, it says. And then fibrocartilage is found between the discs, uh, or is the are the discs make up the discs in between your vertebrae and your back. All right, bone is also called osseous tissue, so you might see either one of those, um, and it just serves to protect organs. Again, we're going to talk about bone a lot more in detail when we get to the skeletal chapter. Okay, but it is a type of connective tissue. It's very very tough. Okay, we're going to find lots and lots of uh, collagen, lots and lots of matrix. I don't think there's a picture. Um, I've, got, I've got a really good slide, I think, of uh, osseous tissue. Oh, there's a great one. On page 72, if you turn on over to 72, you can see uh, a cross-section of some bone. And the little, um, you can kind of see the little black dots are the cells. So there's lots of matrix, not a whole lot of cells there. And you can see that makes it a lot stronger. Lots of collagen found there. Okay, it's very strong. And calcium salts says, look, it says the extracellular matrix contains collagen fibers, which give bone its tensile strength. So that makes it not be able to fall apart if it gets pulled on. And then uh, calcium salts, which are going to make it very, very tough and hard. And that's their calcium, you know, calcium stored in bones, so it, it does do that as well. All right, muscle tissue. Okay, we're almost done. There's three types of muscle tissue found in our body, skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac, and smooth. Now, skeletal muscle tissue, again, we're really going to talk a lot about when we get to the skeletal muscle chapter, but we do need to know how to determine cardiac tissue and smooth muscle tissue. Skeletal is, uh, I mean, muscle tissue is its own. It's not connective tissue. Muscle tissue is its own type of tissue. So we have skeletal is the most common. Okay, we've already talked about that. This is skeletal muscle tissue. And one, the easiest way to tell is that it has these lines in it. Okay.
my mind just went blank on oh striations i couldn't think of the name of those lines for whatever reason but anyways these are called striations these little lines in it okay and usually skeletal muscle cells have their multinucleate which means one cell can have a lot of different types of uh, or not different types but have a lot of nuclei in, even in just in one cell and you can i'm assuming that's what these are right here you can kind of see them there okay now cardiac tissue is a little bit different okay it says this is a major tissue mostly we just find it in the heart okay makes sense and it's really special one it's kind of similar to, to skeletal tissue but it's it's much shorter and there's only one nucle nucleus per cell the other thing it has is called um intercalated discs intercalated discs and you'll see them this is they don't have a picture in the book but i'll i'll get the slide out next week when we do the slides and i'll show you they have these intercalated discs and whereas they still have striations <laughs> they would have like a big break in the cell right here before the next cell. And those breaks are, are important because they are um, able, cardiac muscle cells have to be able to pass along an electrical stimulation. That's what makes the heart pump like it's supposed to. Okay, so it, it can pass along that stimulation between cells and it kind of jumps. Like a screaming, I don't know if y'all can hear them. Um, and then smooth muscle tissue is the last one, and it is exactly like what it sounds. It's very smooth. It doesn't have these striations. They kind of look like long spindles, and um, we find those anywhere in the body that um, basically doesn't have skeletal, like voluntary tissue. So all along the digestive tract is going to use smooth muscle, okay, to make the uh, food or waste or whatever it is that's left in that small intestine or large intestine move through the um, let's see that's kind of the main area but bladder area anything that any other oh blood vessels have muscle tissue so those are all smooth muscle tissue and i have another great slide of smooth muscle tissue and you'll be able to tell uh you can tell very easily i mean they just they don't even have these striations at all now, one other thing you need to write down and know about these is if they're voluntary or involuntary. Okay, skeletal muscle tissue is voluntary. It, uh, you know, you have control over it. Now, there's some instances, reflexes, et cetera, that are involuntary. But overall, when you think about skeletal muscle tissue, it's voluntary. It means you have control. Cardiac and smooth are both involuntary. Right, you don't tell your heart to beat and then it beats, and you don't tell your digestive system to work and then it starts working. It does its own thing. Like while I go in my stomach growl, it's doing its own thing. I didn't tell it to growl. All right, and then last we have nervous tissue, and there's a really great picture of a neuron on the top of page 73 in your book. We have two uh, nervous systems. You have your central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord, which hopefully you guys remember this from your posters or from your projects. And then your peripheral nervous system, which is uh, basically all of the other nerves in your body that don't include the brain and spinal cord. So this nervous tissue is a class of tissue that has a unique ability to convey information by electrical signaling. It's concentrated in the brain and spinal cord, and then, of course, the peripheral system, like I said, goes out from there. Nervous tissue also has support cells, which are the glial cells. These are kind of just like other tissues that says this comes from the root word glue and these are just like support tissue some of them some of them function to um, kind of like eat foreign material some glial cells hold uh, neurons together or connect the neurons so uh, they have different um, purposes and then neurons are actually the the cells in our body that conduct those electrical messages. That's what actually makes us be able to think and, and move our muscles and for everything to work. Okay, so that's the end of tissues all in one day. Okay, but um, you guys do need to, again, go back and read this chapter. We read through a lot of it today. But a lot of this, like I said, is just going to be memorization. It's just learning the different types of tissue. 
and that's just the way it is. So um, you're going to have to learn those. Make sure you know the different types of connective tissue and cartilage. Make sure you know where they, some examples of places where they might be found. And that is that, I think, so.